What's happening, everybody, and how y'all making out? Thanks for tuning in to the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Well, it's not every day you get to catch up with your drum idol, but since I started this podcast, I admittedly hoped I would someday catch up with a major influence on not just me, but so many drummers that were present in the 90s and up to present, and John Stanier of Battles, Tomahawk, formerly of Helmet, and the Mark of Cain. We got to talk about the whirlwind of the 90s with Helmet, torn with Sepultura and Ministry, the three phases of his career, a little drum gear talk, plus impressions of New York in the 80s, pulling off battles as a duo, and the new record Juice B. Crips, and a whole lot more. Speaking of influential drummers, I'd like to take a minute to pay homage to three that we lost this month, and Sean Reinert of Death and Cynic, whose archetype performances on Human and Focus became the absolute blueprint for tech metal drumming, not only at the time, but for years to come. Of course, Neil Peart, who influenced generations of drummers and led them to picking up the instrument, Also a drummer I spoke to John Stanier about and being a personal influence to him. And lastly, a major influence to me in particular in Corrosion of Conformity's Reed Mullen. I first heard COC's 91 album Blind and it absolutely spun my head. And it's every bit of shredding and grooving now as it was then and was the absolute blueprint for what it became Southern groove metal and stoner rock and the melding of all that. So rest in power indeed, Reed Mullen, Neil Peart, and Sean Reiner. I guarantee between Reed and John Stanier, though, I'll likely be subconsciously channeling both of them until the day I hang up the sticks. So it was a trip talking to John. I can definitely say that much. Such is the unshakable influence some musicians have on others. It's the way it works. It's the way you hope it should work. But too many incredible drummers gone in one month, that's for sure. Crash Bang Boom podcast can be found on iTunes podcast, the SoundCloud, and YouTube pages, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and more. If you like what you hear, feel free to check it in the previous 170 plus episodes. Give me a like, a subscription, a positive rating, and or a glowing review. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, etc., where you'll find additional content and updates. So check it out. That would be the jam. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Rugged Press. If you're looking at releasing vinyl, go on over to NewOrleansRugardPress.com to check out the myriad vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, electroplating, and lacquer cutting options. And you can add all those options up in that handy little real-time quote generator. They print both 12 and 7 inch records in 150 and 180 gram variants, and they can help you out with design and more. So give them a holler. And that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. All right, everybody, here we go. The wait is over. John Stanier, crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. All right, I'm here with the one and only John Stanier. I even said your last name right, not you did. to be confused with Stanier. <laughs> I don't know who that is. I don't know who that guy is either. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I thought it was you for many years as well. I might have been one of those people myself. Uh, that's all right. Uh, man, it's great catching up with you. Uh, awesome. I've been a fan since seeing you in the 90s and uh, your subsequent projects throughout the years. So I'm excited to talk to you about some of that Amazing. stuff. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, how are you doing? Congrats on the new Battles record, Juice B. Crips. Thank you very much. I always want to say Juicy B. Crips. I keep it. That sounds like a cereal. But or, or a stripper. Yeah. Or a rapper, stripper rapper. That's yeah. where, what I think, anyway. <laughs> Y'all have some shows coming up, I believe. Uh, are you going to Mexico? or what, do we? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we kind of already did extreme back-to-back touring, which was insane, but really fun. But still, it was like touring like we were in our 20s. Um, <laughs> it was just super, super intense. It was basically non-stop touring. So we did all this touring as quickly as possible. Now we have like a tiny break, and then, yeah, we have a couple like two shows in Mexico and then uh and then it starts to pick back up in the late spring gotcha and then it'll go through probably until the fall I think gotcha but the but the the really crazy touring we we did and it was just like we started in before the record came out we did South America and then from Brazil we flew to LA played a secret show in LA the next morning yeah we landed in LA played a secret show the next morning at like 6 a.m., we flew to New York and went straight to another secret show, which was at the basement of Max Fish, in oh, the basement wow. of Max Fish. Holy moly. Played that. Then we had 24 hours off, and then the next day flew to Europe and did, I think, 13 shows in a row, and then flew from Turin to Tokyo. Yeah. We did uh, Italy to Tokyo and then did... Like the next day, played our Tokyo show, so it was just it was relentless. It, th- that was pretty hardcore, but it was really fun. Yeah, and I then mean, came I, home. I've certainly never been 
ever that busy or had such a rigorous schedule, but fighting fatigue as a drummer and a physical drummer, uh, I imagine that is a, a battle, no pun intended. Uh, was that something that you were fighting on, on such a hectic schedule like that? Um, you know, knock on wood, I've been pretty lucky. Um, old age fatigue hasn't raised its ugly head yet, <laughs> so I'm, I hope it, it won't. But, um, yeah, I mean, 13 shows in a row... 25 years ago was a lot easier than it is now that's I for sure but um you're only on stage for a little over an hour right and if you can't pull something off then you know <laughs> you gotta make it happen yeah so much of it is just sitting around waiting anyway it's yeah. the, the boredom of just waiting to even play is exactly. so much of what touring is anyway right yeah. as far as this new record now battles being a duo are you embracing some of the what I would imagine is maybe a little bit more space in, in the live context, or is it does it feel every bit as full? Do you feel like you're playing more? Do you feel like you need to fill up space, or are you content with where it's at? You know, I think um, we didn't really, you know, to be honest, we didn't really have time to sit down and have this like really big conversation of like okay, now we're going to be a duo, like, how are we going to do this? Like, how should we, like, what road should we, what path should we pursue? Because we were just so out of time, and we were, it, it was such a shock when it happened that we were, we just had no choice. There wasn't a, a, a sit-down conversation of, like, how are we going to do this? Can we do this? Should we be a duo? Should we hire other people? Should we either hire other people to tour? Or should we, like, there was none of that, because we were so late with the record. We just immediately, we're like, let's just worry about all of that stuff later. Yeah. And just, like, take this, take baby steps and do this, like, one day at a time and, like, start, and just start writing. So we just started writing, started writing, um, and it took a third of the time of all of our other records. It was incredible. We did it in, in New York. Yeah. Uh, we wrote and recorded and mixed and mastered everything in New York, which was, nice. which was really nice. Um, I think that had a lot to do with it as well. There were time limits. Um, which are which are good with us because always in the past it was just like however long you need like there was never a time limit and it's just like you know two weeks and you're still not done recording one song oh my like, god ridiculous stuff like that so were you not going in and just knocking out the drums and then saying all right guys you got it do what y'all got to do were y'all going song by song no 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 no, no. yeah it's 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 a song by song thing and yeah it's, it, that's not battles is not that kind of a band but anyway, we didn't really have time to think about it, so we kind of just trudged along, and uh, we never had that conversation of, like, should we be more minimal? Should we be more maximal? Should yeah. we... Uh, it's just, like, Ian has a tendency to write a ton of stuff, and that he generates... It's almost like he doesn't write. He generates <laughs> stuff. So, And then we kind of, like, go through, you know, 450 variations of the same tiny little idea. Whoa. And then, like, find, like, one or two that are... And that's just the way that he writes, which is, which is great, but... Um, this is the first time we've ever had a producer who okay. produced and mixed the record, and he was uh, he definitely like kind of cracked the whip. So that had a lot to do with it as well. Right. Um, it's nice to have an exterior. It was basic, yeah, it's like I mean, to me, a producer is more um, like somebody who is not necessarily telling us like what to do. It's more like when to stop. Or For like real. It's, it's kind of like um, it's an outside person. It's somebody that's like Absolutely. outside of our little bubble. It's like going to couples therapy. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You need a referee. I, absolutely, yeah, exactly. He's a ref. He's a referee. He's just like, this is, song is too long. Right. Like, cut it in half. Like, you know. And he's an outside person, so it's like, he's the person that, uh, there's always, like, when you're in a band, there's always this, like, um, oh, my my wife thinks, my wife likes um, the third song, so we should put that on, the, that should make the record, you know, or like, or my girlfriend doesn't like, uh, thinks that this, we, I played my girlfriend a bunch of the songs, and she said that, uh, you know, the first song is too fast, or like my four-year-old son um really dances and reacts to the fifth song so that should be the single like it's a basically that's you are taking the opinion of outside people then if that's right you know what i mean so it's like and that is where the producer comes in so i feel as though chris tebron really had a, an awful lot to do with this record and making it happen and like um and again it was just like kind of all right we made the record and it's great and everything but how like so how are we going to do this live and we just kind of figured out you know we don't want to just push a button, so yeah, we figured out how to do it, and that took a minute, and um, we're still sort of figuring it out, but uh, it's really fun. Right. So, I've been in bands that were a bit of a dictatorship, and that can be an absolute drag, and I've also been in bands where everyone has an opinion, and then ultimately it feels like stagnation ensues. Exactly, yeah. So it's really nice to actually, my favorite writing creative scenarios in a music, you know, in a music setting is definitely just between two people, especially if you jive well, you can bounce it off, and you can get it done. Yeah, and I, it's funny, too, because with two people, it's like 
there isn't even really any sense in arguing because it's like it's either going to work or it's not going to work. Right. It's not like there is no majority rules. Yeah. There's no, um, you know, it was uh, with uh, in the past with battles, it was always like musical real estate. Everyone fighting for their real estate. Everyone has to get their idea into this crammed into the song. Uh huh. And it's just like the song's only two minutes. Like, <laughs> but, so, and every person has like all these ideas that must go into this song. Mm -hmm. God forbid. Um, and it was just like warfare. Right. And it, in some ways that's cool, but it, you know, f if that's like the entire, if that's like the whole essence of your band, that's just like, it gets, just gets really old. It's not while, sustainable. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it is. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So it was always about like making sure that everybody's happy before we go on. And there's none of that anymore, which is why it was writing was just like, it was smooth sailing. It was like, Effortless. Yeah. It was kind of amazing. I bet. I bet it was. It was so fast. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to playing these songs live, and I think reaching back all the way till the helmet years uh, with with battles, whereas I think a lot of bands with pre-recorded music would sort of tempo map that out and then a click track would ultimately guide them through it. I think it, with battles, it's more of uh, the loops are kind of what you're playing to, essentially, right? Totally, yeah. Which is really interesting. So then I guess the question would be, how does that work with pre-recorded uh, vocal tracks and keeping that in time? In a weird way, the, uh, in, in battles, the loop has always sort of been the drummer, just in the sense that um, I'm, I'm like... The loop is dictating the tempo, it's dictating the time signature, it's dictating um, just the overall mood of everything, and everyone's like is attached to the loop, whether right. they like it or not. So yeah. it's like I'm definitely like really, 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 I'm just on it. I'm, I'm, I become part of the loop, but the loop is like really the master of, that's really running the whole show. So right. yeah, with the vocals, yeah, I mean, they're just on the grid. Um, we've done some of the vocals now, we've done three of the songs with the vocals live, mm -hmm. which was really fun. We had Tunyard join us in uh, in San Francisco. That was totally amazing. She just nailed it. Ish, of course. Of course, Sal a bunch of times, mm -hmm. like more than anybody, Sal Principato. So, but yeah, everything's on the grid. Everything is locked up, and yeah, it seems to work. Right. So, so at this point, I would say, whereas originally maybe with like the mirrored uh, era stuff, uh, there was live loops happening, but I guess in it, with lesser members, are there maybe more recorded tracks and live loops, and that's kind of how y'all are pulling it I off? I mean, yeah, it's, I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, everything is created live on stage. It would be right. impossible. It would be totally impossible. Yeah. So it's just like, I, I hope that people, you know, it's either we hired four other people. Right. Or, I mean, we're doing as much as we possibly can. For sure. Like, Ian is just like... Yeah. Oh my God! It's crazy. Like this, it's insane what he's doing <laughs> live. Yeah. So we're doing as much as we possibly can live, but of course, there's some things that are sequenced. They sure. have to be, but uh, I, most of the loops are actually created live. Right. So. Right. Um, which is cool. And it has its own sort of. Uh, I mean, that's one of the interesting things. I think there aren't many parallels i would say between electronic music and jazz but the idea and and just how haphazard looping stuff live can be and the improvisational aspect of that is kind of akin to jazz in a way which is interesting i think there are some people that think that we're just like like it's all improv up there no. we're just kind of like and it's definitely not right it's like the only thing that ever is improv is maybe some like solos here and there or yeah. uh very, very, very subtle things. Right. But for the most part, like everything is really delivered and well thought out. And I suppose, I mean, it's structured, but if something goes a little haywire, which could happen, then right. you have to adjust to that. And right. adjusting okay. right. to that on the fly. Absolutely, yeah. It's maybe not improv, so to speak, but adjusting yeah. to that, to the to the unforeseen. Absolutely. I've, I've, that's like I've mastered that just over the yeah. years of, of things going wrong. And, and um, yeah. yeah, for sure. That's that that um, I, I had to like think really quick if something goes wrong. In fact, we played London. There's a really big show recently and like 95 percent of the show, we killed it. And then the very last song, I think something happened with Ian's stuff and he freaked out and ran off stage. And I had to like, uh, oh, no. And, and then like he was supposed to come back out. And then like um, our tour manager was like, he's not coming back out. And I'm just like, holy shit. So oh, I had no. to like do like basically a drum solo. Whoa! And then end the <laughs> like end the entire show. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, but it was a really really good show though. Um, I thought, uh, <laughs> but it, I mean it was. I know it was. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. So that was like I had to just like go into like automatic overdrive. I had to pull out the inner showman. Right. 
Wow. Forget inner warrior, inner showman. For real. Yeah. Only guy on stage. Last yeah. man standing. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went straight from the stage right into the crowd. Really? And uh, yeah. Nice. Because, you know, you can't just walk off stage and hide. Absolutely. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nice. <laughs> nice way to cap it all off. Yeah. This was, sh- if all goes as planned, this will be the 170th episode of this. It's kind of crazy that I've been doing it that long, but. One of the questions that I like to ask people is uh, sort of what is one of those unshakable influences that you have as a drummer? And for me, it's uh, it's it's you, uh, which is hilarious because oh. I've spoken to uh, both Dave Turncrantz of uh, Russian Circles and I asked him the same question. And we were both talking about how we unconsciously... Uh, sh- just end up playing like some of your licks oh, crazy. and stuff. And we like, just played with them somewhere. I think in Scotland or something like that, or yeah, Wales or something. It's crazy in the UK, yeah. Nice. So we were laughing at that that we both had this this connection in that way. And then when I spoke to Adam Wade of, of uh, formerly of Jawbox uh, no and played in Shutter wow. to Think, Killer. he was laughing that after Jawbox went on tour with with Helmet, he said that their next record uh, ended up sounding what like what he called the Helmet record. He said that y'all oh, rubbed God. off. <laughs> well. Wow. That was a really long. That was like our. Fr- that was our second tour ever. Wow. Yeah, that was a really long time ago. Yeah. Nineteen ninety. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of those weird things, and it's it's a it's a uh, the a question that I that I ask a lot. So, for for you personally, I guess, what is there sort of an unshakable influence that's lasted throughout your career of drumming that to this day? As corny as it sounds, it's like it's Neil Peart who right. just passed away. Rest so in peace, like, Neil Peart. Yeah. Um, that's like the unshakable influence. Absolutely. Like I would not be a musician if it was not for that guy. Like, he for is, real. The, he's the Ringo for a lot of guys. Cause oh, I've, yeah. I've spoken to older drummers, uh, who, who all, especially if they play anything in regards to rock, Ringo is the guy that led them to that. And Neil right. Peart it was the next generation is from what yeah, I've heard. I mean, and it's not like, I mean, it's, it's, he, it, he was almost like this weird entity that always was always there. Yeah. And I suppose he is al- still always there with, right. You know, you can just go to any records. That's why, like to me, records last much longer than live performances. If yeah. You, if you if you compare the two, the importance of the two. But um, yeah, I mean, again, that's like everyone. I'm sure everyone says that, or John Bonham, or Neil Peart, or you know, whatever. But uh, I just really can't think of anybody yeah. else. Um, if you're, if we're talking about an actual person, yeah, like yeah, no way, hands down. Right. That's amazing. I mean, it, it, being un- alive in the 90s, it was crazy. And I guess from your perspective, uh, f- from the inside looking out, from my perspective, just seeing the wave of influence and, and once again, sort of like everything from like growing up in the South and seeing like rednecks to jocks to like to, to whatever. It was amazing. Uh, the I would hear people quoting your 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 licks and stuff. It was really crazy. it was really crazy to see how it permeated. And still to this day, like I was talking with Dave, still in our embedded, seared into the back of our brains, we're unconsciously even doing it. Uh, so it's it's a it's a trippy thing, man. If you, I think most drummers that I've spoken to in the '90s uh, are like, you get mentioned a lot. Damn. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those trippy things. Did you have a sense of of your influence or helmets at the time? Hell no. 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 No way. The only answer you can say to that is no. Of course not. Right. So. It's one of those weird things, man, because the way that I found out about Helmet uh, back in the day, and of course this is, you know, early 90s, uh, one of my, two of my buddies, in fact, uh, Helmet went through New Orleans and y'all played the RC Bridge Lounge. And it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was meantime hadn't come out and y'all were still touring, oh, wow. okay. but y'all, y'all had announced at that show that, hey, we have a new record coming out. It's called Meantime. It'll be out on this date. And my friends, uh, they said that they were like one of nine people that, that were there. And uh, they said they were completely blown away. But the way that they found out about it, once again, indicative of pre-internet times, they went to see a band a couple weeks prior, and there was a Helmet flyer. And the guy, the drummer that was in that band said, man, you got to come back in two weeks and see this band, Helmet. They're amazing. And they went back, and they were totally blown away. And they're the guys that ended up telling a lot of people in New Orleans, I feel like, about y'all. Wow. So it's one of those, yet again, another bizarre connection. Yeah, that's, yeah. I don't, <laughs> it's just, it, especially back then, it was, it was really weird, the whole word of mouth and flyers. Totally. And like, it was pretty strange. Radio meant so much more. Right. You know, um, especially college radio meant, meant so much more. Those early years of touring, I mean, do you look back on that and just kind of marvel at, at, at the whole experience of it oh, all? Oh, yeah. I, I was talking to someone... Um, 
last night actually about how uh, it's. I, I mean, in one, you know, I'm much older now. We are much older now, and I. I Me too. There's well, <laughs> I mean, I feel like um, I can't figure it out because I know that there are like younger bands that tour. I just feel like touring has really changed, and it's. I'm never going to tour like I did in the early 90s ever again. And that means I'm never going to like be in a van and play, you know, Sioux City, Iowa and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Canton, Ohio and yeah. St. Louis and Kansas City and Salt Lake City. And I mean, maybe I would if I was opening for some humongous band like right. U2 or something that plays yeah. all these places. But <laughs> yeah. for, I mean, Battles will never play those places. Right. I mean, we did a long, long time. When we first started, we did. But now I feel like I feel like we should just for the hell of it. But I know that we wouldn't play to many people, and that's fine. Yeah, I'm not expecting to. Um, but I feel like touring has really changed. I feel like now it's like festivals have really taken over. For sure, um, festivals and they're all, it's year round now. It's not just in right. the summer. They're year round. A lot of them are in the U S. And it's it's all like a lot of more like one offs and mm -hmm. um, more festivals, more one offs and small little tours. Like I. I can't even remember the last time I did an actual like coast to coast U.S. tour. It's right. always just like a West Coast run, mm -hmm. you know, and then some time off, and then we'll do the East Coast run and stuff like that. Um, and it's always just like select markets. It's never. Right. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why I I don't, I don't play Richmond, Virginia anymore. Um, right. <laughs> but there was a time when when we did when yeah. we would play like you know Richmond a lot and D.C. and Baltimore. So yeah, I feel like touring has changed, but maybe it's just changed for battles. I think that's kind of the case because I know that there are you know, like young young bands, of course, or you know, there's shows everywhere in the U.S. True, every night of the week. So it's weird, and we're very like Eurocentric too. I think uh, I would say so. I, I mean, I guess it's just the nature of the beast. Our labels over there, the music that we play is probably a little more familiar with over there. Although that is sort of changing now here, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, it's very strange. Uh, I was always impressed with the way you kind of orchestrated beats and then pretty much stuck to a lot of that stuff live. Right. Uh, to the extent that when I saw Helmet years later and I saw John Tempesta, he played all of your fills. Oh, wow. It was Actually, I just met him for the very first time. <laughs> Dude, like he played your fills. A week ago. That's crazy. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, there's a lot of fills in that stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of fills to remember. Uh, but I guess there wasn't any, any, any specific like recording process, like for meantime, was there any pressure when you signed to Interscope? Did you feel? No, not, not at all. I, yeah. I mean, I was really young. How old that, were you? I, I was, uh, uh, man, I was 21, wow, 20, 22, dude. something like that. You were um, a hell of a drummer at 21. Shit. Thank you. Um, <laughs> It was a weird time, and it happened so fast. Yeah. It was like a complete blur. And it's I bet. just like, what? Like, within, in the course of a year, we did, like, it was insane. It, everything happened really, 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 really fast. For sure, because I know, like I said, my buddy saw y'all at the RC Bridge Lounge. The next time I saw y'all, y'all when y'all were coming through, it was at the State Palace Theater in New Orleans. Yeah. So I think one of those might have been with the Rollins Band and Sausage, Les yeah, Claypool's yep, project. Yep. I think it was one of those shows. Yeah. I don't recall the other bill, but I, I remember loving the shows, obviously. Yeah. But it was it happened fast. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's like in the blink of an eye. It's like we just quadrupled our audience. And then it went even more and then even more. So um, I don't know. I mean, Interscope was really, really aggressive. I, I thought that they were, I think, that they are a really good label still, I yeah. suppose. Um, but back then, when they first started, they were really aggressive, which was pretty cool. Very cool people. We just kind of went for it, I guess. Like, it, you know, why not? I guess, right. kind of. But again, it was like, it's not that I don't remember stuff but it just happened so quick and i had no idea what was going on and it's just like like i said it was very young y'all are lucky that y'all were young enough to commit to it once that was put in front of you and just go for it at that point as well and for sure just blindly fucking hit it commit yeah. to it yeah which is amazing i feel like all of my 20s were spent on tour really uh, from 20 to 30 like 20 to like 29 i was i was touring at any point, did you not say enough of this shit already? No. Really? Not at all. No way. To this day? Yeah, I mean, even... Oh, yeah. It was awesome. I mean, there were like, you know, like yeah, anything, there were great times, lame times, <laughs> boring times, but it, for the most part, it was like, yeah, I have zero regrets. So it was awesome. Yeah, Fuck it was yeah. incredible. What was one of the longer runs that you recall of, of, of one of those tours? We did this, it was Sepultura Helmet Ministry. Wow. Tour, and that was Europe and the US. And it was, that was long. That was like, I don't want to quote what I think. I, I could be totally wrong, but that was, I just remember it being Europe and the U.S., and it was like, it was so long 
and so back to back that we didn't have time to go home for Thanksgiving. So we had Thanksgiving at Al Jorgensen's house in Chicago, which was really nice of him yeah. and his wife. That was awesome. But uh, but yeah, it was like all of Europe and then east to the west coast. I think that was huge. Wow. What what year would that have tour have been? Do you recall? Ninety two. Wow. Maybe something like that. Wow. So that's that would have been probably Sepultura Rise and Ministries uh, Psalm sixty nine record, and then I guess Meantime came out ninety two. So yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. That's a it was in between Meantime and Betty. Right. Because we had already toured. Our first really big tour was Faith No More. Wow. In the U.S. Whoa. Um, that was our first like opening up for a band, for a really big band, Faith No More. Uh, and then, yeah, what was after that? And then um, <laughs> and then Ministry, I think. God, I, I, I'm, I know I'm going to forget something. Right. Well, but, uh, yeah, Sepultura in the early '90s. Uh, I I had I had a ticket to see them when they came through New Orleans, and they played with some other bands. And uh, that show got canceled. And to this day, I've, I never got to see them. But I heard everyone that saw them in the '90s said that they were just pummeling. Yeah, so, totally awesome. That's awesome. I talked to Igor almost every day. That's awesome. Another guy <laughs> that I want to talk to on this podcast. Yeah. What up, Igor? I stay at his Let's house. Talk. I, I, I yeah. WhatsApp. We WhatsApp like pretty much every day. That's awesome, man. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. And ministry as well, man. I mean, I saw them in around 92, I believe, 91 or 92. And they were they were absolutely one of the most incredible bands yeah. around at that time. So, I mean, that's what a crazy lineup for y'all to be I on. mean, I definitely, f- I feel like um, when, we r- when we wrote and recorded Meantime until we were done touring the Betty record, that was just like, did not stop. That was like unbelievably long. It was incredible. Like, and I think the the time in between Meantime and Betty was not that long. Really? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was. I that mean, was ninety two, ninety four. Crazy. So two years. Yeah. 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 Fucking a. And then wow. Yeah. So it was like three years. I was like, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> wow, man. One question about, I guess, the helmet uh, recordings, and then even up up to modern times. Uh, did you use the same snare on all three helmet recordings? No. No way. Oh, it was all different. No. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I always saw you playing with what appeared to be like a five, five and a half by fourteen. I I don't know if it was a superphonic or a Tama steel snare. They're Tama. I usually I'm you know honestly I'm 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 terrible with gear questions, really bad. <laughs> um, and yeah. I the Strap It On record uh, is a Slingerland snare um, that I actually just got refurbished and is now. Um, it's not the Gene Krupa snare, is it? No, 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 no. Okay. It's just like a, it's a, a steel, so it's not yeah, really yeah, that yeah. big of a deal. Gotcha. Um, and then, uh, and then I got on Tama right after that, uh, like Tama, like really early on. So big, yeah. huge shout out to Tama and Zildjian. You've been playing their stuff forever, man. And Zildjian, yeah, forever. They're, they are the absolute best. Um, it's been nice uh, to have the continuity of that throughout all your different projects. I feel like you've retained some of your sound, but part of that is consistency in, in both your playing and I think what you've chosen to play. For sure. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there have been nothing. Th- they're they're so incredibly cool. And um, but I, it's always been. So I don't. I don't have. I think I have like three or four of the same brass Tama snare, and it's just like yeah. whichever one isn't like rusted or broken or like. Right. And they're just like, oh, this one's broken. I got to use it. So it's. I I never really know. There's like, f- I have about four Tama brass snares, and I have no idea which is which. And I, I hear just, you. That's, that's hilarious. But that's what's on. All the records in the same drum set. Actually, no, I had a this pair of blue, I think, R S R twos uh-huh. that I played on Meantime, and then they, then they were like, pick out another set with a different color, and we're gonna we're gonna do a like giveaway on your first drum set. Wow. So then I got another drum set, and I still have that now, and that's been my main. I have a yellow R S R two yeah. that they don't make anymore. Um, and it's still like the absolute eight, Juice B. Crips. Like ninety nine point nine percent of that record is is that amazing. The, that drum set. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, fucking a man. So post helmet, what'd you do in the interim? I guess the helmet ended badly, and um, I didn't want to. I wasn't in a, in a in a in a huge rush just to jump into another band. And then I started uh, DJing a little bit, and then I started taking that really seriously. And then the next thing I knew, I was like DJing like six nights a week in wow. New York, and um, so that was like for about a year. I, I like really took that serious. Then I was in a band in Australia oh, in okay. 2000 called The Mark of Cain. Okay, and went down there and recorded. And you made then some it was cool like, records with them. 
I did two records with them. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, at first it was like, can you come? And I, we knew, I knew them from, they opened up for Helmet a million years ago in Australia. And they were these brothers. <laughs> yeah. And they contacted me. They were like, hey, you want to play drums on a new record? And I was like, sure. So they flew me down there. I played. Then I came back. Then it was like, can you come down and do a video? And I was, did that. Then it was like, can you come down and do a show? And the next thing I knew, it was like, tour, I did like five tours with them. Wow. So I was, I was almost living down there in 2000. Damn. And then Tomahawk started. How'd you come across Mike Patton? And Well, I had known Mike Patton from when we toured, toured with, with Faith, Faith No More. No More. And then, um, uh, I, you know, I knew Dwayne Dennison more. It's really his band, so he started it. And I know him from the Jesus Lizard, who Absolutely. Helmet had toured with extensively many, Love many that times. Band. Yeah. Really good friends with him. And he had been talking to me about this project that he's going to do. And that took a while to get off the ground. And then, like, finally Mike got involved, and then that's when it, like, really... You know, just like let's just put it out on his label, Ipecac, and um, it happened pretty fast. The first record, and we had Kevin Rutmanis, who used to be in the Cows, and Melvins, then he was in the yeah. Melvins. By the way, that guy has the most distinctive body wiggle, movement. Wiggle. It's like a snake whip. It's his wiggle. It's yeah. he's got a little wiggle. Yeah, it's the it's cr- out of time. It's yeah. totally out of time. Yeah, it's awesome. He does it the same regardless of what's happening with That's the song. His thing. Yeah. It is fucking crazy town. Yeah. I've never really seen anybody that does that before. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> It's really good. Perfected in the cows. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Another crazy band that I used to go see in the 90s. My God. Yeah. It was Helmet Ended Badly. I DJed for a year. So it was like two years. Yeah. I think it was exactly. It was like 1990, well, 98 and 99 maybe. Uh-huh. And then, uh, or 99, 2000. And then 2001, it, it happened. But it was like, I said yes to, to, of course, I wanted to play with Dwayne and Mike uh, on, on this project. And it was just like, all right, meet us in Nashville in like two, you know. Here's the record. Uh, what do you think? Da 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 da. And and like two months later, it was like, okay, come to Na- come to Nashville, bang it out. We banged it out really fast. Nice. And then it was just like, let's start touring. We played everywhere once, and then um, and then right after that, we started with the next one and recorded that in L.A. And then again, like toured everywhere. And then at the end of that tour, this is the second record, Mitt Gas. At the very end of that tour, Tool invited us to tool, to tour with them and that was re- that was nine weeks that was nine weeks wow. in the u.s and it was like like thir- sea level cities in the u.s it was you know it was like fort worth instead of dallas it was st paul instead of minneapolis it was uh tacoma it was you know like it, it was like oklahoma city um tulsa it was and it was all like arenas um right. and that was awesome that was really long but uh <laughs> those guys are like amazing road dogs totally i i love those guys so much they're, they're the incredible. nicest people in the world yeah and i've known them for a really long time since back in the really early 90s um and they're just super super cool guys i'm glad they suck to their guns and do things their way and um i, I have nothing but incredible respect for them absolutely and as people and as musicians as well but that was a really long tour and then we took and then after that then we took a bunch of time off and then battle started then we, I did another Tomahawk record, but that was like this concept record, and we didn't tour on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just the three of us without uh, Kevin. Uh-huh. And we didn't tour on that, and that's fine. And that's right when Battles was really starting to... That's around Mirrored, when Mirrored kind of came out. And yeah. um, and then Battles really started to like take off, and that turned into like a, a really, really, really serious thing. I didn't think that... B- Battles was a very slow... A slow burner, like uh-huh. really slow. It was like a simmer for for a couple of years. It, we were just we were trying to figure out what it is that we were doing. We we're pretty conservative. Um, we toured a lot, but it was a it was a very slow build. And then we signed to Warp and put out Mirrored. And then it was like after that, it was just oh wow, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Growing up, man, uh, where are you originally from? Where did you grow up? Because I've, I've read a couple of different things, so I don't actually know. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Okay, that's where my wife's from. Oh, nice. So my entire family and uh, uh, my, my whole background goes way, 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 way back. Um, all Pittsburgh. Right on. Um, and, and then my father was a professor, and then he got another job at another university, and we moved to like suburban Fort Lauderdale. Oh. Which is where I went to high school. I went to one year of junior high school and then all four years of high school there. And then um and then that's where, you know, I, I really got into punk there, like towards the end. So then I was in a bunch of hardcore bands there. And then I went to college in University of South Florida, which is in Tampa. Yeah. Um 
but I didn't graduate. I, was, I only went for two years, and I was in more, even more hardcore bands there. Um, and then that's really kind of where it started. Is, okay. Is in college, I was in one band, um, but it was a, it was like a had a really big following and played a bunch of shows and um, was really hardcore. And uh, that's when, um, that's when I really knew that like I don't want to be in school. And and I, in fact, I, I entered school with a as an orchestral percussion major. Okay. And with a minor in mallets, uh-huh. and I was so bad that um, <laughs> I the professor like made me change my major. So then I changed it to like English lit um, after like a year and a half, and then that was that. And then you know that, I don't know why I even chose that major. And, and right. um, I just I was just only into playing. I was obsessed with being in a band. Yeah. So then I did the uh, the whole you know I told my parents like I'm going to take one year off of school, and if nothing and move to New York, and if nothing happens, I promise I would, like only one year and if, and if nothing happens i'm gonna go, go right back to school and then of course i you know i came up here and it did happen within a year but i wouldn't have gone back to school anyway but but Why it happened pretty quick um i honestly i've like flipped a coin between new york la maybe chicago right um i was just yeah i mean i re- i i uh, almost ag- auditioned for dag nasty okay when i was um when i was in college because this is a very funny story but i saw i went to see scream in nice. Gainesville, and I loved Scream. I'm hanging out with Dave Grohl afterwards, <laughs> and I'm like, man, like, come on, man, you you gotta know somebody who needs a band in DC. And he's just like, I I really don't. And he's like, oh wait, m- maybe. And then he like went into the van and ripped through his uh, his backpack and pulled out his like a dress book, and he gave me the number for the singer for Dag Nasty at the time. I was like, cool. And then I so then I had about four conversations with that guy, and almost flew to DC, um, but I'm. You know, I'm glad I did. My life would have been a totally different, wildly different. Yeah, completely different. I I don't know what I would be right now, but but uh, it just ended up New York. I think it was, a lot of it was like a really good friend of mine. His uncle owned an advertising agency, and there was an apartment I could stay in, and like so there were all these kind of like leads, and I knew some people up there already. So it was like this kind of seems like the best place to go. Although you know, New York in 1988 was uh, very 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 different. Oh, I then, can't even imagine. Yeah, it was you know it was it was a pretty scary. I don't not scary, but it was like bleak, or you just had to like really pay attention. Yeah. You had to pay attention to what was going on around you at all times. Absolutely, kind of. So it wasn't, you know, there. It's scary is the wrong word. It's more like uh, you had to avoid like certain areas. Of course, just, you had to avoid like certain blocks. For sure, which was really weird. Like, yeah, you know. It was really don't walk between certain streets between C and D. Right, for sure. Deep Alphabet City was fucking dangerous. Yeah, in nineteen eighty eight it was definitely like this block it like just just go the extra block and go around and come back, you know. So, yeah. Because I knew a lot of people that lived down there, so you know, and I lived I lived on Clinton. On Clinton and uh between Stanton and Remington in nineteen eighty eight. Nice so. Flurry side. Yeah. Damn dude. Yeah. I guess what was there much of a scene, uh, quote unquote, or like any particular scene where? Because I've spoke, I spoke to Rock Savage from Bark Market, and I talked to Vinny from Unsane, and I nice. just as as somebody who uh, came into New York in '05, I obviously don't I'm just attached from that whole world. There's a rumor that Rock actually saw Hendrix. That's insane because I interviewed him. I can I'll text him after after this. Amazing and ask guy, him. awesome. I will drummer. totally ask him. Awesome, awesome drummer. drummer. And yeah. that band. No, was, there's a yeah that he actually saw Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> he did not mention that. I'll text him after this and ask him. That's amazing because now yeah. I got to know. Yeah. Uh, and Vinny, of course, he's been around forever. Forever. But, yeah. I see him all the time in Williamsburg. Yeah. He's the best. Total character. Yeah. Total him. character. Guy almost best. died like two different times. Yeah. He's an amazing character. Yeah. But I guess what I'm getting at is I, I spoke to those guys about sort of how their bands fit in to a particular scene or were they outliers? So I guess that would be my question at the, the kind of at the formation of Helmet. Were, were y'all outliers? Did you feel as though there was a scene that you were a part of? No, I mean, we were absolutely, uh, definitely. Um, if I remember correctly, in 1988, there was like two scenes. There was the, the there was New York Hardcore. So that was like the CBs, and it was everything was at CBs. So right at, at CBs or like the pyramid. Yeah. And at CBs, it was there was the matinee, Sunday matinee, and I guess there were shows during the week or whatever. But um, so there was like New York hardcore, and then there was like the New York kind of arty noise right. rock that was continuing on from the early '80s, like you yeah. know, when that was like Sonic Youth, Swans, Rat Rat R, right. 
stuff like that. And now it was basically those bands and more now. So, um, you know, uh, Fetus, stuff like that. And so there was a lot of, we were part of that scene for sure. So it's gotcha. Unsane, Surgery, Helmet, Boss Hog, Loudspeaker. There's a million other bands I know I'm yeah. forgetting. But that era, so that so that was the era that we started out in. And it was absolutely was a scene. Right. A very, I would imagine, a sp- small scene, but one nonetheless. Um, it wasn't that small. It was, really? it was, yeah, it was pretty big. And then, um, and then we were on. We got signed to Amphetamine Reptile, right? Which was like the kings of that, and they were in Minneapolis. Um, and Surgery was on that label. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that whole scene, the Amrep scene. Unsane, I think we're on Amrep. I, I think they um, might have been, yeah, for a minute. Right. Um, and then that didn't last very long, though. It only lasted, and you know, back then. When you're really young and you're here, it's like everything seems like an eternity. When in reality, it was like you know six months or something. Yeah. It didn't last that long. And then as soon as we signed to Interscope, and in meantime blew up, we started touring heavily. And then from that moment on, it's like we weren't really a New York band anymore. Right. So we were very we were like a, we were claiming New York for a very short amount of time. But the Strap It On record, all those lyrics are about living in the you know living in east village and lower east side in like 1987 stuff like that it's a lot of it is about crack and shit like that it's about (laughs) it's just about the 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 urban you know decay of Mm -hmm. that area during the time so it's like it really is strapping on is a super duper new york record right a heavy 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 new york record yeah all um everything's about new york everything else i don't know what is about his lyrics but but uh but Strap It On is like, yeah, that's that's an extreme New York record. Right. But then when Meantime came out, it just ha- that happened really fast. And then it was just like, oh, wait, what? Now we're... And it, then it was just like constant touring. Yeah. And I think there was there was a time... I did this twice that uh, I was in between apartments. This is back when, you know, I'd live in six apartments in one year. Uh, I know. Like bouncing around and like staying in people's bedrooms. and Yeah. But there was a time <laughs> when I knew that we were going to go on tour for a super long time. And I was like... And I, and I was about to move into a, an apartment, and I was like, man, why am I... I so I, I ended up putting my stuff in storage and, like, just sofa touring for, like, over two years. So two two years? years? About two years, yeah. So for t- <laughs> I was on tour n- for two years. I was, like, nomadic. Holy but it, shit. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway. It's just, like, you know, um, right. that's how, how heavy we were touring. So, Damn. But I, that's when I was in my early 20s when you can do that. I could never do that now. In fact, like I said, I tried to do that again in my 30s, and I was just like... Pfft, Forget this, man. Like I, I, I just, it, I didn't last at all. I right. was like, you know, the not having an apartment thing is, you know. But when you're in your twenties, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. And half the time, I was like, oh, we have two weeks off before this tour, and I would just like stay in L.A. <laughs> really? or like stay in like Minneapolis. Yeah. I stayed in Minneapolis once for like a week. <laughs> stayed in Lori Barbero's closet. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. Uh, Amazing. So, yeah, but those are all, that's when you're much younger and you don't have as many responsibilities. Absolutely. But, but uh, yeah, so from then on, basically, it's like we weren't really, and that was it. And that's really, yeah. that was the last, Tomahawk was from all over the place. And yeah, then that was really, the, the, the irony is that um, that was the last time I was in a New York band in a scene until Battles. And then right. when Battles happened in, like, 2003, that was absolutely a scene. Totally. Majorly. It was, like, Williamsburg. It was the Williams, it was the, the Williamsburg scene. It was, like... And everyone rehearsed in the... That was a really fun time. I feel very fortunate that I've had... I've had, like, three careers in a weird way. Yeah. Most people have one. And I, when I say career, it's not like... I'm not saying, like, success. I'm just saying um, I've had the opportunity to go from the beginning, like, scratch to, you know, to putting out records and touring and having people like you. That's happened three times now, which is amazing. That's amazing. So it's like when that happened with Battles, it's like, man, this is happening all over again. This is awesome. It's like it's an absolute scene. It's like everyone's in the same rehearsal room. It's like Interpol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Liars, TV on the radio. Totally. Um, you know, every, everybody hangs out. Um, and Williamsburg is like it's, uh, you know, I had lived in Williamsburg in the early 90s and there was no one here. Right. Um, it was actually kind of boring. So now it's like <laughs> people are starting to move here. So now there's like a lot of stuff going on. And, and it was like seconds. Well, not seconds. It was minutes before it became like really lame. Yeah. Um, so it was like this really, there's a really sweet spot in a, in gentrification. I feel like yeah. it's, it's a neighborhood is bad and cheap and artists move there. Then it becomes cool. And then there's this like kind of sweet spot where it's like just before the developers come in and it's, it's just, game over and and, right. and everyone finds out about it so it was like around 2003 2004 i thought was really really cool it was like a lot of you know black dice um 
there's so much awesome stuff going on here. And then that's that's the that's it. Yeah. I think. Wow. So. Damn. Yeah. Sounds pretty killer, man. I don't know the answer to this, but I'm just going to guess as to the, the reason behind it. And, and hopefully, pardon if the, the redundancy in it, but as far as the high symbol goes, when I first saw you do that, I imagined from my perspective that with electronic music, because sampled symbols sounded like shit, you don't really hear symbols in electronic music. And with hip-hop, with you, if you had to sample drum breaks, you would likely do that without cymbal hits to make it more seamless for right. the loop. Why is the symbol so high? I would put it up there so I would be less inclined to hit it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really, it started out as a joke. It's right. like when, when, we, when Battles first started, I, I wanted to be, the, I was like, all right, this is some totally other. And they had already played, I think, two shows. But they weren't called Battles. And they didn't really know what they were doing. And it was like, you know, um, just experimenting with loops and stuff like that. Yeah. We weren't called Battles yet. And um, when, we, when we started the band... I wanted to originally have it be as minimal as possible. Mm. It's extreme minimalist drums. And at first, I didn't want to have any cymbals at all. Oof. And then I was like, all right, well, i got to at least have some hi-hats. So then it was like, well, okay. Then I had one cymbal, but I, I was like, I'm only going to hit this when it's a, as a marker. Right. Or like when, when, some, you know, when a really big deal happens. So those first EPs, um, I, I think there's a couple songs where I hit it once or something like that. And it's a... Uh, and so our, our very first show, we opened for Le Savi Fav, um, and at North Six, which is now Music right. Hall of Williamsburg. Yeah. Um, and our first show was opening for Le Savi Fav, and I think TV on the radio, their first show was opening for us. Oh, crazy. Uh, and they had briefcases. They, like, anyway. <laughs> um, no, so we're opening for Le Savi Fav, and I was like, Hey, isn't this funny? Hey, you guys, isn't, like, I'm going to send my symbol as high as it possibly can go. And I was like, isn't this hilarious? And everyone was just like, Le- you got to leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. <laughs> and uh, so I did. I left it. And um, and then it just kind of just became this thing. Nice. And now it's like, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's totally out of the way. Right. Uh, but for a reason. Sure. You know? um, and I don't want, like, a bunch of splash symbols and, like, nah. like all these symbols everywhere. I just don't. Not in battles. I mean, every other band I'm in, yeah, it's it's standard you know, three symbols, but in battles, it's just one. It's still, it's a big deal. Right. When I, when I hit it, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good way to reprogram yourself after years of hitting symbols all the time. At least I, I think it would be for me to just put it a little bit more out of reach and yeah. force myself yeah. to just be more. I don't see it. I don't pay attention to it. I have to look up when I hit it. I can, <laughs> yeah, you know, totally. Um, and yeah, it's a big deal. So yeah. right on, man. Yeah. Well, shit, John, it was awesome talking to you. Absolutely. Uh, as someone who grew up in, uh, in my early band, I played two helmet covers, which Whoa. is, I know, FBLA, the first one off Strap It On, not to be confused with FBLA 2 off of Meantime, just, wow. for, just oh to clarify. <laughs> I know, we played not one, but two. Wow. Uh, so it is absolutely surreal uh, catching up with you, and especially as someone who uh, is a great drummer, I've always enjoyed the projects that you put yourself in, and so uh, it's like a a goal uh, as an artist, I think, to find yourself in uh, projects that you enjoy doing. And, hey, you made a life out of it. So Awesome. I think you won. Ah, I don't know. (laughs) The verdict's out. All right, John, good talking to you, man. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed talking to John. Thanks, of course, to John for catching up and rapping with me. That was absolutely killer. We'll catch you all in the next one. Crash, bang, boom!